I'm John Mulladu. I'm a member of the What Matters to Me and Why Organizing Committee and a Senior Director in the Office of Strategic Communications. And I want to welcome you to this 19th in our series of What Matters to Me and Why talks designed to build and strengthen bonds between people who teach, learn, and work together daily and to foster understanding of how each of us embraces the UCI values. For those who haven't attended one of these talks, the Advisory Council on Campus Climate, Culture, and Inclusion with the support of the Office of the Chancellor, began presenting this series in 2012 to offer a glimpse at what's behind the persona and provide a chance to ask questions of esteemed members of our faculty and staff who make UCI such an exceptional place. Now, a few details before we begin. As you can see, like our 18 previous talks, we are being videoed. Uh, if you do not wish to be seen in the video, please take advantage of this opportunity to move to the back of the room. Following the talk, please complete and turn in the survey that you were given. Your feedback is very valuable and helps inform our planning. Also, when you leave, please take your lunchbox and dispose of it in the cans outside. Our next talk is April 8th, and will feature Michelle Goodwin, Chancellor's Professor of Law. Registration opens approximately three weeks before the talk, so watch your email or go to our website after midweek next week. This series attracts a diverse group of faculty, staff, students from across the campus, so uh, it's our tradition here uh, that before each speaker is introduced, we uh, ask you to take a minute to introduce yourself to the person sitting next to you. So please do that now. And good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to another action-packed, fun-filled, exciting What Matters to Me and Why. And I'm so happy that you're here. And uh, I'm glad that you exchange uh, talking with each other uh, when we have this little break like that and uh, maybe continue it on <laughs> afterwards. It's my real delight to have the opportunity to introduce our speakers as a member of the committee. And uh, today's speaker is Dr. Mark Warshar. He's a professor and associate dean of the School of Education with a joint appointment in informatics. A former Spanish bilingual math teacher, he's taught or conducted research at Moscow Linguistics University, Charles University in Prague, uh, Czech Republic, and also at uh, Waseda, Waseda University in Tokyo. And he served also on a, a US aid project in Egypt. Professor Warshauer is a world-renowned scholar on technology and learning who seeks to unlock the potential of digital media to help diverse learners overcome their challenges. One of his projects examines the use of telepresence robots to enable children with cancer to attend school from home. And another project explores how digital scaffolding can help immigrants learn to read. Very interesting projects. As the founding editor of two groundbreaking open access journals, <coughs> Professor Warshauer is deeply committed to making educational research freely accessible to policymakers and practitioners throughout the world. In 2014, in honor of his research and service, he was named a fellow of the American Educational Research Association. More than anything else, Mark is a proud father of his three children, ages nine, nine, twins, <laughs> and 10. <laughs> and a loving husband to Keiko Parada Warshauer, a professor of political science right here at UCI, who joins us here today. So without further ado, please, let's give a great anteater welcome to Professor Mark Warshauer. Thank you, John. How's the sound? Well, thank you so much to those of you who have organized this remarkable series and invited me here. Uh, Doug Haynes, John Maladu, uh, Jonathan Fong, John Stuper, a lot of Johns here, Daniel Kwong, Rebecca Thompson, the entire Advisory Council on Campus Climate, Culture and Inclusion. And thanks especially to all of you who have come here today. 
Uh, it's such an incredible honor to be invited here to, to speak with you. And it's also been an amazing opportunity, really a gift to me, to be given the chance to, to reflect on life and its meaning and share that with you. I was born in a quiet middle class suburb of the San Fernando Valley uh, in the mid-1950s. As I grew up, I had three central drives, which sometimes overlapped, sometimes were in competition with each other. To understand the world, to feel connected to the world, and to change the world, to make it a better place. I was always extremely curious. I wanted to know everything about everything, but I didn't quite know where or how to start. I was especially good at math, and I used to spend my free time deciphering codes, studying chess moves, I taught myself to play blindfold chess, and I amazed my friends when I beat them. <laughs> and then, as the 60s and 70s evolved, and the world was changing so much, I became really interested in a wide range of social sciences to help understand what was going on in the world. And especially psychology, cognitive, humanistic, social psychology, everything about psychology to help me think about what people in society were all about. And I was fascinated by languages and cultures. You're getting the idea that I'm not one person who sticks with one thing. Uh, foreign languages were both a new code for me to decipher and also a key to understanding the global community. So I eventually studied 10 or 11 of them, getting conversational in most until a new one would drive out the old. I found all of this thrilling, and especially when I could mix or match several languages in a day when I was traveling in Europe or Asia. All of this might sound like a fun intellectual adventure, and it was, but I was also tormented as a youth, figuring out whether to go to college, whether to go to graduate school, what courses to take, what majors to pursue, and especially what career I wanted to seek. My life was also affected very much by the turmoils of the time. My earliest school memory is writing a poem about John F. Kennedy. Shortly after that, he was murdered. More assassinations came soon. As a teenager, I read a great deal about World War II and the Holocaust, which had ended only a decade before I was born. And I developed a deep sense that something like that should never happen again, and that if my own life was not devoted in a way to try to keep things from happening like that again, then, then what was life all about? I felt people's pain and persecution deeply. I couldn't look away. By then, the Vietnam War was heating up, and the nightly news was filled with stories of massacres and napalm. It seemed to me that persecution was happening again, and action was called for. As a high school student, I became involved in the anti-war movement, traveling from Los Angeles to San Francisco on overnight bus rides to join national demonstrations. Of course, the 60s and 70s were not only a time of anti-war activism, but also of broader social movements for civil rights, women's rights, and cultural liberation. And I was shaped by all of these. It was a time for asking questions. And for me, the questions revolved around how I could make meaning of my life during a time of counterculture, uh, psychedel psychedelic and sexual exploration, identity movements, uh, challenges to oppression and war. For me, the question basically was, do I want to be an intellectual or do I want to be an activist? Or how can I combine these two? And how, how can I connect to other people who are trying to both understand the world and change the world? So during this process, I faced a number of decision points along the way. And these tended to paralyze me. The first big choice was where to go to college. Oh my god. Uh, I applied for and was accepted to both Brown and UC Santa Cruz. And around that time, in the early 70s, both of these were getting a lot of attention for shaking up the undergraduate curriculum, doing away with grades, uh, better student-teacher relationships, more student power. Uh, so I thought about this, I thought about it, I thought about this, and eventually I applied to Brown to be a mathematics major. Well, not unlike me, I thought about it some more, and at the last minute I deregistered from Brown and I rolled in Santa Cruz, because Brown was the established place <laughs> But Santa Cruz was the real upstart in the Redwoods. And in a they were forming, it's, those, some of you might know, it's based on colleges. And they were forming this brand new college within the colleges. So it wasn't just the experimental level of Santa Cruz. It was Kresge, where we were going to do sensitivity training and tea groups 
and participatory democracy, and I couldn't resist. Uh, so it was a very exciting adventure, but I struggled with finding an intellectual and social identity. One quarter, I would take all uh, honors math and science courses and do pretty well, and, then I, and it was a fun intellectual challenge, but then I would say, there's this war raging on, and what's going on in the world, and why am I studying physics? And so then I would start taking sociology and community studies and psychology. Uh, I studied closely for years with Michael Kahn, who had collaborated with Timothy Leary on his LSD experiments in, at Harvard, and who was kind of a guru in the Esalen-inspired human potential movement. I took workshops with Richard Bandler and John Grinder while they were developing what later became famous as neurolinguistic programming. I took courses with William Domhoff, who wrote powerful critiques of Who Rules America. And I heard lectures by Gregory Bateson, who helped found the modern field of cybernetics. A key juncture in my studies came in the third year when I discovered this field called computer and information sciences. Remember, this was you know, the early 1970s. I didn't really know what this was. I took one class in, uh, one or two classes in programming with these huge mainframe computers that had less power than my iPhone, and we punched into, uh, you know, punch cards. And I liked those, but the real, cl the classes that I really liked were the ones in, you know, probabilistic thinking and reasoning, decision sciences. I was trying, I was trying to find a way that I could take use of my mathematical and critical thinking ability and apply it to trying to understand and solve real world problems. I thought about changing my major to computers and information science, but I didn't want to delay my graduation. I finished up with a humanistic psychology major. I tucked this away for later. <laughs> All the time, I continued my social activism. Uh, in the early years of the war, I, I joined pitched battles in the streets of Santa Cruz during the sit-ins against the war. Uh, pursuing my interest in communal living, I did a study abroad uh, trip to work on a kibbutz in Israel. Uh, I drove a tractor, delivering things, picked, potatoes, picked sugar in the fields. It was a fascinating experience getting to know Israelis who themselves are from all over the world and the volunteers who are from all over the world. Uh, the kibbutz, it was also, by the way, the only kibbutz in Israel that has a pork factory on it, so that's another interesting story. <laughs> but the, the kibbutz was located uh, near Nazareth, and I got to know a number of Palestinians as well, and I grew concerned and disenchanted with the way uh, that they were treated, which pushed me further to the left. I also spent a week after that uh, in a summer camp in Jerusalem that was uh, working with brand new Jewish immigrants from North Africa, who in the early 70s were very, very poor, and it was as, as poor as any tenement in the eastern United States, which was an interesting experience too. So after graduating from college, I stayed in Santa Cruz and I looked for work. Uh, my first post-college job was in a cannery. Without any other employment prospects, I was so thrilled to get the job, which paid $7 an hour, which in 1975 wasn't bad, that I voluntarily took the night shift rather than the day shift, because then I could start earning money that night rather than waiting till the next day. <laughs> uh, my job entailed putting on this yellow suit, climbing into this big vat that was filled by uh, mud and rocks and asparagus with a drain at the bottom, and climbing into the bottom of it and clearing the drain out so that you know, the mud could go down and da 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 da. It was so miserable that I quit in the second night. <laughs> uh, so I got my next, next job, a real step up as a busboy for $1.35 an hour. Of course, we'll get a few tips. Uh, wondering what to do next, I was inspired in a public lecture by Tom Hayden. Some of you might have heard of was a leader in the anti-war movement and later a California state legislator. Uh, he, he suggested in his lecture, all you anti-war activists wondering what to do now that the war's over, you should go work for Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers. I didn't know that much about them, but didn't, it was better than working as a busboy, so I called up their office. They were very surprised because usually they had to work so hard to recruit people, and here was this guy banging on the door saying, sign me up full time. Uh, but I worked for them for about a year. Uh, I got paid room and board and $5 a week for about 70 or 80 hours of work. 
Uh, and we were in, in the streets of San Francisco, uh, Oakland, uh, San Jose. Uh, I went to union meetings, church groups, student groups, and I basically organized people. I showed them slideshows. I invited them to the protests. I tried to raise a few dollars. We were organizing boycotts against grapes. Uh, the farmer presented an electoral campaign that we're working on. And to the extent, really, that I think I have any le educational leadership or administrative skills today, it's probably all back to uh, those days as a farm worker organizer. An interesting little side note, Cesar Chavez had very good relations with Jerry Brown, who was governor then. So we actually got sent up to Oregon for a few days to work on uh, Jerry Brown's presidential campaign. And it's remarkable when I f reflect back on my old life, you know, many decades ago, that Jerry Brown is still governor and could even run for president today. <laughs> So, so after that year, my appetite was whetted for Spanish language and Latino culture. I got a job through some family connections in a warehouse in Los Angeles to save some money and teach myself Spanish. I took out a Spanish textbook at night and studied vocabulary and grammar, and then I started practicing with my Mexican coworkers the next day. I had never taken Spanish in school. But I got pretty good at it out of a few months of working there, and then I traveled to Mexico and Guatemala for five months. And I met a lot of other gringos, but I was very obnoxious because I was the one who refused to speak to them in English. I wanted to learn Spanish, and I spent five months uh, basically using only Spanish, and I got pretty good at it. So then I, got, I settled in San Francisco afterward, and I got my uh, first job in education. This one probably paid about $5 an hour as a bilingual teacher's aide, helping immigrant children in the Mission District with their math and English. I spent a number of years in San Francisco, and again, in very tumultuous times. I feel like I'm, uh, what was the name of that movie about the guy who's always in different times? Forrest Gump. Forrest Gump, yeah. <laughs> uh, with the uh, murder of Harvey Milk and, Mary, and Mayor Moscone was I was there, uh, the onset of the AIDS epidemic, which devastated the city, uh, this whole mass suicide in, in South America. Uh, anyway, with a couple of gap years out of the way, now it's time to think about graduate school. I had applied and been admitted to a program at Stanford in Engineering Economic Systems, where I thought I could pursue the dream I had developed as an undergraduate, to use mathematical and computational <laughs> thinking to tackle real-world problems. To so show you how decisive I am, I applied three times, three years in a row, and I got admitted every year. They really wanted me to come, but I just couldn't pull the trigger. I was, I was at the time, I was getting more involved in community activism in San Francisco, uh, protests for bilingual education, against racism, with various kinds of groups. And it just seemed too elitist to leave that behind for a Stanford graduate program. So after several years of indecision, I abandoned that path. I stayed in San Francisco, and I got a teaching credential at San Francisco State University, which I thought would allow me a career, but situated in the community. I became a Spanish bilingual math and ESL teacher at Newcomer High School, which was a brand new school for new immigrants. And not surprisingly, I also did a bit of rabble rousing there. <laughs> so uh, they had a series of kind of subpar principles. Again, you have to understand the economic climate in schools. They can't always hire the best. They took somebody who had been an assistant principal at a high school, had failed, dumped him over on, on Newcomer High. He didn't know anything about bilingual education, and it wasn't all his fault, but he was getting pressure from the central administration for budget reasons to cut back on courses. So students could no longer take six courses, they could only take five, and these were all brand new immigrants, and they had to learn English and get their courses to graduate, and they were all furious, and the teachers were furious too. What, what people didn't know is a lot of those immigrants were from Central America, from Nicaragua and El Salvador. Some of them had been fighting in the mountains. <laughs> So a lot of them were activists, and I kind of planted the seed, you know, what if you had a sit-in against this? <laughs> and somebody, I don't know who, the same day that the seed was planted, called up the San Francisco Chronicle and other uh, outlets and said, you might want to stop by Newcomer High School at about 9 o'clock this morning. Well, sure enough, uh, you know, a few hundred students went into the gym instead of going to classes and started demanding more classes. And, Better Education, and the Chronicle, and other press were there. And lo and behold, uh, the principal was fired the next day. Uh, the students got the classes they wanted. Uh, within a few weeks, they had given a great new principal who knew a lot about bilingual education, and the school thrived after that. 
uh, going on and on, <laughs> a lot of stories. So I continue to get uh, more and more involved with activist groups, especially those protesting US intervention in Central America. I eventually left my job uh, to go to Washington to become a national coordinator of the Committee in Solidarity of the People of El Salvador. Did that for a couple of years, and then I went back to the Bay Area, and I worked part-time as an ESL and GE teacher, GED teacher, but I continued to be uh, basically a full-time activist, uh, riding, organizing, leading delegations to, South, to, to uh, El Salvador, to Nicaragua, uh, smuggling film into political prisons in El Salvador so we could take prisons of the prisoners there and come back and organizing campaigns. I've done a lot of stupid things in my life. <laughs> uh, so this was my life until about the light, late 1980s. For that decade of the 80s, activism had won out over intellectual life. Uh, but then in the second half of the 1980s, the left, me, and a lot of people around the world were shaken up by a lot of the revelations about, of Mikhail Gorbachev about the nature of the Soviet Union. I mean, we still thought the things we were working for, bilingual education against racism, for peace in Central America, were worthwhile. But the idea that we were really going to devote our whole lives, at least for me, to the organizing the left started losing appeal. I was fascinated, though, what was going on in Russia. And I was, already, uh, and I was also getting ready to turn my away from full-time activism and to think about my career. So I applied for a US-sponsored teacher exchange program as a curricular consultant at Moscow Linguistic University. Uh, lacking a graduate degree, I wasn't accepted. Undeterred, I decided to go back to school. Uh, and I got a master's degree in teaching English to speakers of other languages, or TESOL. After graduating, I applied to the same Moscow program, but now with better credentials in hand. And I also applied to a, a program for a Fulbright lecturer position in Prague. They didn't have any in Moscow. The nearest one was Prague. Well, I got accepted both. Another paralyzing decision point. Do I take the money and the prestige of the Fulbright, or do I follow my dream to go to Moscow? Well, you know where I went. <laughs> so in Moscow, uh, I lived in a student dormitory, hanging out most evenings with a group of ethnic Greeks from Soviet Georgia who were becoming Greek teachers. And every day, I braved the winter snow to teach at a university that trained many of the finest translators and language teachers in the Eastern Bloc. The students of that storied institution were shocked and delighted, though many of the faculty not, uh, when I brought my guitar to class to teach them American folk songs to show them how music could be integrated into education. The year I was in Moscow was also the year that the US started giving Russia emergency aid. During my university break from work, I got a job as a Russian English translator, I kid you not, uh, believe it, uh, with a US aid caravan. We traveled to Perm, a formerly closed Russian city on the foothills of the Ural Mountains near West Siberia, and visited the orphanages, prisons, hospitals to bring aid. Though we were largely bringing completely useless things for Russia, like bottled water or like powdered potatoes, <laughs> uh, still, every night, our Russian hosts threw these uh, expensive banquets for us where they spent much more money than we were bringing in value in the aid. Well, anybody who's been to Russia knows that they like to drink a lot of vodka, and they make to, like to make a lot, very long toasts, and they like to combine you know, making toast with drinking vodka. And I don't like to drink that much. And after two or three nights of this, one day I was very hungover and I said, tonight I'm, not gonna, I'm just not gonna drink. I'll bring it to my lips, pretend, and put it down. So of course the person there gives the same speech what I had heard about four or five times, which is, way back in 1945, the American and Russian comrade soldiers met on the Elbe River, and now after several decades, we're coming together again. And it's going on and on and on and on think, OK, I'm going to get out of it. And then he looks at me and he says, directly at me, and he says, if you believe in the future of the children of the world, drink up. <laughs> <laughs> Another hangover. <laughs> uh, after a year in Moscow, I reapplied for the Fulbright. And I, and I, I got it. And I spent two years in and around Prague. Uh, walking through the Prague Castle, over the Charles Bridge, right into the old town of Prague to work every day at Charles University, one of the oldest universities in the world. 
Uh, these were very exciting times, both personally and professionally, to be in Central and Eastern Europe. The Soviet Union broke up while I was living in Moscow, and Czechoslovakia broke up while I was uh, living in Prague. I was telling this story at a conference once in Houston. Somebody in the back put up their hand and said, and how long did y'all say you're going to be in Texas? <laughs> uh, one of the most uh, interesting things for me, important things for me about being Prague, that was the first time I got an email address. I started using email. I didn't know what the internet was, but I knew what email. And I finally found the holy grail that allowed me to pull all my interests together in computer science, global communication, language, community organization, psychology, social mobilization. I became passionately involved as an educator and researcher in trying to understand the use of the internet for language, literacy, learning, educational reform, social equity. Some colleagues and I started an international email discussion group for English language learners to practice their language skills while talking about music, sports, politics, or culture. I can still remember a Japanese student going on and saying, you know, I like to walk on the beach, and a Chinese student going on and saying, but what about the Nanjing massacre? <laughs> It was, it was tough, but it was interesting. Uh, after three years abroad, at the age of 40, I entered the PhD program in second language acquisition at the University of Hawaii, where I started studying the internet and learning. I like to joke to people, you can decide whether it's true or not, that I got involved that when I went to the University of Hawaii and I saw a sign that said, surfing lessons. And I went there to check it out, because I like the beach and this and that, but we learned to surf the internet. <laughs> Later on, when I was giving workshops such as that, I, I met my lovely wife, Keiko Harata, who's a professor at Cal State Northridge. Uh, I did mostly qualitative research in my studies, believing that would help me best understand the factors that shape technology use. So my dissertation was a series of case studies uh, of internet and learning in a conservative Christian college, a working class community college, uh, uh, programs at a research university for academic English, for Native Hawaiian preservation. It's trying to look at the way that culture and, and social context affected internet use and learning. And the main lesson I learned at that time was that there's a tremendous contradiction between the power of new technologies to aid literacy, learning, and education and the complexity of institutional and social obstacles that prevent that from happening. And that's really been the research trajectory uh, that I have followed ever since. So upon graduating there uh, with my PhD in 1998, I forced another fork in the road, a lot of forks. So I had interviews at some excellent universities for tenure track positions. I had earlier, somebody early asked me, they said, we're putting a bid on for this $52 million USAID contract for educational reform project in Egypt. You'd be a great educational technology coordinator. Can you write you in? My modus operandum would say, sure, write me in. You know, it might help you get the grant. I can always think about it later. Well, sure enough, they, they got the contract, and they invited me to go to Egypt. Well, if I, if I knew then what I know now about how hard it is to get a tenure-track job, I probably wouldn't have done this. <laughs> but again, I was you know, young and stupid and adventurous, and I, I thought, wow, if I'm interested in the social and cultural context of technology use for learning, I mean, Egypt? <laughs> you know, it, it was a no-brainer. I had to go. So uh, while I was there about three years, and we led initiatives to train university and K-12 instructors in how to use the computers and internet and integrate them into instruction. We traveled to the smallest villages to visit schools, often accompanied by hordes of government ministers and police. Fascinating. Uh, trapped as we were between what I usually refer to as the two largest bureaucracies in the world, the US Agency for International Development and the Egyptian Ministry of Education, our project failed in, in bringing about any lasting educational reform. We worked on a lot of show projects, if you know the whole field of aid. At the same time, we had a lot of success in building grassroots networks of technology using educators. I still like to joke with my Egyptian colleagues that our efforts in teaching people about online communication eventually contributed to the internet-fueled Arab Spring that happened about a decade later. <laughs> Uh, later, I leveraged the work I did in Egypt and, and in a number of other countries and, to write what was probably my best known book uh, called Technology and Social Inclusion on how to co overcome social inequality with technology. All my trips abroad have had a profound influence on me. I like to say that living in Israel 
cured me of naive faith in an infallible Zionism. Living in Moscow cured me of my infantile Marxism. <coughs> and living in Egypt cured me of my knee-jerk anti-imperialism. I didn't completely abandon any of those positions, but over time I have developed a more nuanced understanding of global problems, so to say. Coming back to the US, I was fortunate to land a job at UCI. My research picked up where I had left off. I started researching in particular what they call one-to-one -one schools, where all the students had laptop computers. Uh, some of my work praised such schools when they were well organized and achieved positive outcomes. In other papers, I have seriously critiqued uh, programs that were done poorly. Since educational technology use requires excellent planning and teaching, my mantra from that research is that laptops make a good school better, but they don't make a bad school good. Over time, I moved from uh, principally doing small case studies, which had contributed to my books, to larger mixed method studies, which involved seeking grants, hiring graduate students, forming teams. I also became passionate about building what was at that time our very small department. And as I said earlier, I found that my community organizing experience helped a lot of that. More than anything, though, I was finding connections in a more intimate way through my growing family. After many years of trying, in October 2002, Keiko and I were blessed with a beautiful young son, Michael Kai. The next 10 months were the happiest of my life. Then in August 2003, everything came crashing down. Fatigued from too, not too much work and a bad night's sleep, I became fatally distracted, leading to Mikey's death. Keiko never blamed me for a second, but I was not so forgiving of myself. In those days, I faced the biggest decision yet in my life which was simply whether to live or whether to die. With the support, with the loving support of Keiko and so many of you here, I decided that dying was not an option. And if I was going to live, I had to continue to try to do my best to serve others in my family, the university, and around the world. I thank you, those who supported me. The path to overcome Mikey's death has been and will continue to be long and difficult. But over time, my wife and I started to find joy especially through our three beautiful children born in the following years. Danny, 10 years old, is a precocious child who loves to swim, play piano, read and write, and in addition to, in addition to English, also knows some Japanese and American Sign Language. And he happens to have Down syndrome. Danny has taught us so much about humility, patience, love, and what matters in life. Mika and Noah, our nine-year-old twins, are also very special in a myriad of ways. They ask amazing questions like, if it's the 10th month, why do they call it October? <laughs> Think about that one. <laughs> when Noah was five years old, he asked that. <laughs> there is an answer. Look it up online. <laughs> Mika, when she was five years old, said, do bees sting other bees? <laughs> I love how they make us think. All three have an amazing sense of humor and a real knack for picking us up when we're down. So Danny, Mika, and Noah, I have a feeling you're going to watch this video someday. And when you do, I want, just want to assure you that your mother and I love you more than the air we breathe. And we're so grateful for having given us a reason to live. Our family had one wonderful adventure together that I must share, a year sabbatical in Tokyo. Continuing my string of bringing bad luck to countries, you know what's coming next. <laughs> Japan was hit by a 9.0 earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear disaster during our stay there. And to make it even more poignant, it was four years ago today to the day. Wow. 3.11, you might have heard that first. <laughs> it was a humbling experience to see firsthand the stoicism and kindness of the Japanese people as they coped with that triple tragedy. Just one tale. A lot of people there belong to food co-ops because you know you don't have cars, you have minivans, you can drive around and go shopping. We belong to a food co-op. So every week somebody came up and brought food to us. It was in these huge carts with ice and they took the elevator and dropped it off. Well that afternoon, an hour or two after the earthquake, this guy comes you know, knocking on our door with all these, this food. Except all the elevators were down in Tokyo. So he had basically decided that he was so dedicated to getting food to people in this time of tragedy that he was going to continue his uh, shift, even if he had to uh, carry upstairs. Being in Japan that year 
gave me a chance to learn about my wife's country and culture at its finest, and also see our children blossom as bilingual and bicultural world citizens. The icing on the cake was the opportunity to write a book with my wife for the first time, Japan, the Paradox of Harmony, published last year by Yale University Press. She's obviously the main author. She's a Japan specialist. <laughs> I did a little bit on education. So what matters to me today? I still remain committed to justice, not in the fiery way of a 20-year-old anti-war activist, but in a more measured way of wanting to understand and overcome what contributes to educational and social inequity. I'm committed to building knowledge. Though as a senior faculty, me <coughs> faculty member, I'm inclined to fill the role of a research entrepreneur, helping to pull together and guide teams working on a broad range of overlapping projects, rather than singularly digging deeper and deeper on narrowly defined questions. Our teams are carrying out a wide range of projects uh, using quantitative evaluations, qualitative eva observations, and new forms of data mining and machine learning. And I'm so proud that uh, some of my grad students and colleagues who are working on this project are here with us today. Uh, we've developed software to analyze hundreds of thousands of student essays written on Google Docs to examine how patterns of writing, collaboration, and revision contribute to learning outcomes. We study how new forms of digital scaffolding are helping immigrant children to better develop their reading, writing, and language skills. Veronica is piloting pres uh, telepresence robots that enable children with cancer, heart disease, and autoimmune deficiency to attend school from home. Uh, Lynn and others also conduct studies right here at UCI and Bianca too, where with the support and assistance of many of you, we are observing scores of undergraduate practices. Uh, to scores of undergraduate courses to examine the relationship between instructional practices, problem solving, peer collaboration, flipped classrooms, online instruction, to academic achievement and persistence. As my whole life, I remain a highly social animal, but now my social ties are satisfied much closer to home. Rather than traveling the world, learning every language I can, and exploring diverse cultures, I'm content to stay in Irvine, dedicated to my family life and to working with the many graduate and undergraduate students in the Digital Learning Lab and with all my colleagues in the School of Education. I'm committed to serving the school and university, which I fortunately have many opportunities to do as Associate Dean, and also to serve the educational profession, but in a ways that allow me to stay at home without traveling. For example, through a new open access educational journal that my colleagues and I are editing. Throughout all these decades, my pursuits have taken me many different directions, but I think that my three lasting passions have remained the same. For seeking knowledge and discovery, serving my family and community, and struggling for justice and freedom. I also feel deeply that these values for knowledge, community, and justice represent the best of Jewish traditions. And perhaps that helps explain why, while I'm not really a religious person, my sense of cultural and ethnic, Jewish cultural and ethnic identity is very important to me. In summary, my life has been a mostly joyous but complicated journey, summarized perhaps by a poem I wrote a quarter century ago while living in Moscow. I'll close with that, and it's called The Path of Life. As raindrops gather in the hills and flow into a stream, so do the droplets of our hopes come together in our dreams and forge a little creek and then a river that runs strong, flowing down this path of dreams toward everything we long. Friendship, health, adventure come so easily, it seems, as we barrel toward the sea on the rapids of our dreams. Romance and excitement, success, we have that too, as we move with confidence on a path that seems so true. But the path of life and not of dreams, it seems, is not so straight. Obstacles abound and divert us from our fate. Rocks and wind and stormy days block us from our end, and our river must change course before it flows downhill again. But maybe on those stormy days, our true course can be found, for the path of life and not of dreams is not straight, but is round. A cycle of discovery that renews itself each day, revealing life's true splendor in a million special ways. So savor every obstacle that you may come upon. Seek new paths with joy, and your own true way may dawn. Thank you.
Thank you, Mark. And now is our time to open it up for questions. And uh, we have uh, people with microphones who will meet you so we can get it on the uh, recording. Very colorful, Mark. Thank you so much. Very delightful. Some questions. Yes. You've done so much. What's that? <laughs> well, as I, you know, as I said, I, I'm pretty much a homebody. I, I don't really like to travel that much. I, I turn down opportunities to travel all the time. My my language learning days are over. Uh, you know. In the, in the whole field of second language learning, there's a debate about at what age it becomes hard to learn a second language. For me, it was 40. After 40, I just gave up. I spent a whole year in Japan, I didn't learn a phrase. <laughs> uh, so really, it's my, it's my research, it's my family, it's my students, it's, it's UCI. I have no big ambitions. Uh, it's whatever I can contribute here with my family and, and university and community. I have a question from the other end of your story, the beginning and uh, when you were doing all those things, you know, from college and a little bit after, how did your parents feel about your choices? <laughs> you know, it's really strange. I think I mentioned my, my parents had both dropped out of high school. And uh, I thought they were very controlling, but when I look back, it is actually the complete opposite. I mean, I will tell a story uh, I think this was between when I was 11th and, well, when I was about 15, my friends, we lived in the valley, my friends and I, we couldn't drive yet, we used to hitchhike into Los Angeles, buy the stack of uh, Los Angeles free presses for 15 cents each and sell them for a quarter each and make some money. I did that until somebody drove by and just stole them all from me. Uh, then when I was 17, I hitchhiked with my friend up to Vancouver and back. Then when I was 18, I hitchhiked across the country. So if my, I mean, if, if my kids even hinted at anything like that, you know, actually kids, if you're watching this, that's just an allegory. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it was a different era. I mean, the funny thing is, I mean, it's, I guess it's sexist in a way. I mean, my, part of it is a, a sex thing and part of it is an era thing. You know, my, my, I was born in 54. My uh, sister was born in 51 both because she was a girl and because it was before all this hell started breaking loose, it was completely different. You know, she was treated differently, uh, but they had, they had little advice for me, they had little control over me. It wasn't like I was rebelling against them. They were like, okay, just be, come back. <laughs> Uh, incredible set of coincidences uh, between your activism in many, many places and uh, what ensued. And, and some of them seem actually more directly re, uh, related to what you were doing, especially that high school incident. Um, uh, but but you, were, you must have remained active in these places too, maybe not responsible for some of these uh, world changing events. Uh, you know, by the time, as I said, I, you know, I was. This was really fascinating to me because it wasn't like I had a story that I just had to figure out how to say. I had to figure out what my life story was. And I look on it, there's kind of these decades, you know? And the 70s was all this time of youthful exploration and then I started to become kind of this hardened leftist and then the 80s was this kind of hardened leftist. And then I kind of left that behind. I mean, I still had some of the, some of the same perspectives. I mean, they kind of changed over time. But uh, no, I wasn't like uh, in like Moscow or Czechoslovakia, you know, uh, leading protests against the government or anything like that. Uh, by that time, I'd kind of made a shift back to, to my career. And uh, so I think at, uh, at Newcomer High was like the last time where this kind of uh, came together. Oh, one thing I did do in Czechoslovakia, I'm a terrible singer, but I like to play guitar and sing. And somebody invited me to like, you know, not be the main performer, but like the, pre, what do they call it, the person who goes on before the main performer. So I, I, I sang two songs, 
And, and given my background in protest movements and this and that, I sang the sounds of silence and the times they are changing. <laughs> and, and, and six months after that, Czechoslovakia fell apart. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, would you kind, uh, kindly comment about uh, the incident here on the campus about uh, the six students and the, incident, uh, the flying? Uh, I, I, was, I was very disappointed uh, to hear that. Uh, uh, you're talking about the flag? Yeah. Uh, there was an incident a few days ago where uh, a group of students you know, voted to, to remove the flag. And, I read that, and it seemed like the different students had different motives, you know, uh, there had been some conflicts about having a flag, and several of the students said they just want, didn't want to have any conflicts, and they said they wouldn't support this anymore. So different people had different reasons, and having been an activist when I was young, you know, I could, I, it's hard for me to look at what young people do and condemn it as being extremist, but uh, it's, it's not something that I thought, think was positive for, for UCI. do you have for students? Well, I guess I'm going to have to say follow your heart. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I do feel that. Uh, you know, you only, have, you only have one chance to live. And you can't do what other people say makes the most sense for you. Even if, it, even if you know, you can't make a piece of paper and write down the advantages and the disadvantages, and, and say, this one has more advantages than this, I'm gonna do that. I mean, sometimes doing that is a value because it helps you reflect. I'm not saying that you should make you know, spontaneous decisions, and this sounds exciting, I'm gonna jump and do it. But after you've thought about it, after you've consulted, after you've talked with people, you have to do what your passion says because it's, it's your life, and it's your only life, and you're never gonna have another life. And I don't think it's worth living unless you make those difficult decisions that are true to your own heart. Does that extend to not attending the final? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, in this case, I kind of agree with uh, John Wooden, which is, you know, live as if you're going to die tomorrow but uh, learn as if you're going to live forever. <laughs> so I would go say going to the final is part of the learning. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Mark. We want to thank him. It's been a great welcome.